Oh, yeah, video. Um, yeah, kind of cruddy raining and such, but uh, so we're halfway to the hostile day encounter, hopefully. I mean, hopefully there'll be a part two, <laughs> even though the part one ended kind of hostily. I told them ahead of time I did have to leave. Uh, but anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, because it was all very late because he had internet trouble, so it was supposed to be done hours before it ended up getting done, and yeah, so it's not good for my schedule. Blah, 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 blah. So I was a bit irritable anyway. I got this bad leg on top of everything else. I pulled a muscle in my leg. So that's why I'm doing a video. It's because basically, um, I have to walk because I can't run. So anyway. Um, so what do I want to get to? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so the conversation ended at a point where, you know, he was using this argument that, um, um, you know, that because I... And because I am informed by my um, sensate mind of reality, in the sense that I am informed what sensation is. And so that's what I'm saying. I'm saying being conscious allows me to understand what sensation is. You don't have to explain sensations to me. If I was an intelligence and I never experienced a sensation, which I don't think would be possible, but let's say it did happen, um, it'd be very hard to explain sensations. It would be very hard to explain what it is to feel. And all I'm saying to him is, is that consciousness informs me of this qualitative sensate mechanism common to all the organisms that we know of on Earth that have brains that are sensate. That it's this capacity to feel these very um, significant feelings, you know, significantly bad and significantly good in the sense of relief from bad feelings, loneliness or sadness or some misery. When those miseries go away, it's a very good feeling. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that I'm informed by being conscious. Now, he wants to turn that into, well, what I think psychologically about vagina is what I'm saying everybody else should think. Like I'm ignore like 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 my psychology defines my philosophy. No, I wasn't using. I'm not using my personal psychological experience as evidence. I'm using my personal sensate experience as evidence. The fact that I know what a good feeling is and a bad feeling is is the the end of the information I'm using. I'm not using personal bigotries or biases as evidence uh you know because i like the american football more than uh british football doesn't mean uh anything and i know it doesn't mean anything and i'm not making the argument from i think because i feel um, i'm just making the argument that thinking is informed by knowledge of the feeling mechanism not knowledge of my psychology. That's a long way of having to say that I know the difference between philosophy and psychology. I'm not arguing I've been informed by being a bigot, <laughs> but I have been. You know, I have been informed by having a psychology, understanding that it makes me want things um, recklessly and um, uh, selfishly. And that that's a part of my psychology, that is my psychology, and I have no respect for that. I don't consider the fact that I have a psychology meaningful beyond the fact that I do have one. But it has no uh, meaning as philosophical information beyond the fact that we know we have psychologies, that we have bigotries, that we have personal biases based on our personal experience. I wasn't arguing personal bias, I wasn't arguing for some personal opinion of evolution, I was arguing an absolute description of evolution, an absolute description of the fact that sensation <coughs> is substantially different than any other phenomenon taking place on Earth or in the universe, that it is qualitatively substantive is my fundamental argument, and I know it's qualitative substantive because I personally have tasted it. I know it. Well, anyway, 
this distinction really shouldn't have to be made in the context of half of the day. So that's what sort of pisses me off, is that he's already heard this argument. He knows that this is a done argument. Um, I shouldn't have to explain that I'm not arguing for some personal prejudice or bias. I'm arguing that I know what bias is because I have the mechanism. You know, I have the, <laughs> the mechanism of attraction and repulsion built into me, so now I'm qualified to talk about what it means to be repulsed or attracted. Duh. I mean, <laughs> and the alternative for a conversation would be impossible anyway. There's no, if we, if we don't concede that we, there's some commonality between our conscious experiences, some um, in its basic nature that, that it creates positive and negative sensations uh, through a pretty generic uh, function, then there, we can't have a conversation. Because then we're going to have to say that the guy who's talking to his dog is really talking to his dog. Or some other kind of nonsense. Uh, so these are like premises of having a conversation at all. Is accepting that we're going to presume, uh, you know, basic common function. So we can make distinctions between somebody saying, I feel twice as much as you. I mean, there's just no point in having the premise of the conversation being... You know, my headaches are twice as headachey as yours. It might be true, but there's no way to have that conversation. Um, there's no way to make those kinds of relative comparisons. So that would be off the table anyway. It should be an expectation that that would be off the table, that we're not going to argue double headache power or, uh, you know, all that kind of crap because there's no point in. You can't go there, because you can't put two consciousnesses in some sort of chamber and have a controlled experiment about what they feel. Oh man, this turned into, this really, see, this is why I was pissed off. This is like, why, you shouldn't have to get into something that requires a whole lengthy conversation about distinctions between talking about what something is and understanding it through personal contact and uh, you know even even finding a metaphor for it is so difficult or an analogy for exactly this kind of accusation of a, a philosophical bias because you say I've been informed by having consciousness I mean of course having consciousness is the only way to be informed of what consciousness is there's no other you can't take anything else out of the universe and use as an example of consciousness. <laughs> you can't you can't metaphor it to anything. You can't analogize it to anything. There's no again, like I'm saying, you, if you had the task of explaining consciousness to something that never felt, never had a good or bad feeling, it would be impossible for you to explain. It'd be, there'd be nothing. You could give it no, oh, it's like, you know, chocolate bar. <laughs> you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't compare it to anything. It, it's unique. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> you know, what can I say? Yes, I've been informed by being conscious. He's going to argue because I've been informed by being conscious that I've been bigoted by being conscious. And, and that's just a, it's an argument I can't do anything with. Uh, and it's one I could throw right back at him, and then we're just arguing our subjective impressions. I'm saying I have a philosophical argument I'm making based on the nature of evolution, and he's countering with it's subjective. Uh, sorry. Um, I think that's a... It's, 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 a, it's a leap. Uh, it's going way too far, and it should be off the table as an accusation just because as soon as you say that, then we're just arguing pessimism versus optimism rather than arguing what's the merit of things. Well, what's the real substance? Uh, this isn't about pessimism and optimism. 
It's about what is logically indicated by the evidence. Is there evidence that most of the things that drive us, most of our ambitions, desires, and drives are psychological phenomena, not logical phenomena? That we're not logically figuring out what needs to be done. We're feeling and we're saying, what do I feel like doing? And most of our life, we avoid conceding to logic only when necessary. We obviously do our work. We do things we don't want to do. Um, and we don't feel like doing. Because no, there's a future obligation. And if we don't do it, we're going to feel bad later. There'll be a penalty to pay. The whip. So the vision of the whip uh, and the pain of the whip deters us from not doing it. So again, it does become a feeling reaction. Yeah. So anyway, I don't want to go into a whole lengthy, bibbly babbly boo about all this, but um, uh, yeah, so that's probably enough. So part two, hopefully we can get past that without me having to make this video all over again and explaining the difference between uh, understanding the ability to feel and um, describing what you personally feel. I'm not attempting to use the argument from my personal feelings. I'm using the argument from I have personally experienced it and I know therefore the difference between feeling good and feeling bad. Yeah, mostly. So, I mean, it's just irritating to have to, you know, I mean, there was a point in the video where, you know, you, you just start thinking about human beings and you start saying, you can't communicate with these assholes, <laughs> you know, because they, they really have no interest in uh, staying on the subject. You know, you put the question to them, you know, how bad would World War III have to be? Uh, for you to say no mas. And they won't even really answer the question. And if they do, they just do it with a glib. I don't care. Um, and that's a real, you know, they just keep evading taking responsibility for the fact that these are real impositions. The harm is going to be real. It's going to be imposed without consent. And we're certainly not qualified to play with consciousness. Uh, you either know exactly what you're doing or you leave it alone. Uh, whoa. Spooky. Spooky, spooky, spooky. <laughs> yeah, the tall grass made spooky sounds. Anyway. It's, I mean, it's really cold today and rainy, but it's sort of a nice little break in the middle of the heat wave. So I guess it's acceptable. A little bit of a hurricane nearby, blowing stuff around. Um, so it's okay-ish. And uh, you know, hopefully my leg will stretch out some more. Feels old better, but it's, it's like in my calf. Well, it's in between my, it's right, right behind my knee actually. It's just all fucked up there for some reason. Ow. Um, for the bush. Um, yeah, so that's enough. Sorry, I didn't mean to drag it out, but, you know, that's what I do. There's any wildlife in here. I uh, saw a frog, but it got away. Um, oh, yeah, see, that hill was a problem. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit uncomfortable. Anyway, um, talking about... So yeah, so we'll see if we do a part two. And uh, it just seems like he's gonna keep wanting to say there's merit to our personal um, opinions of rye bread. You know, <laughs> like, oh, I think rye bread is so delicious, therefore rye bread has intrinsic and fundamental value. And it's just not the truth. Uh, our sensations have value, but they only have value because we have been put in the deprived state, the negative state, where we need 
something to cheer us constantly. We constantly need cheering up kind of a thing. The default state of the sentient is negative. Uh, anyway, and there's, but there's no intrinsic positive anyway. Like I said, you can't make a gift for the universe because the universe doesn't need anything. Anyway, enough said. So, till the next time. And such.